I am very thankful that you all made it out uh, to hear this uh, discussion tonight uh, by William Hartung. Uh, I've had the pleasure of spending the last couple of hours with him, and uh, uh, he's got 40 years of experience uh, exploring these issues, and he's probably uh, the most knowledgeable person that I'm aware of to be able to talk about these issues, and thankfully one of the people that are still raising the issues and putting it out in the public for us to digest. Uh, my name's Jerry Link. I'm chair of the Peace Education Center, and uh, uh, we're the prime mover of the event tonight. Um, but I need to also thank the many, many co-sponsors who have uh, put this out uh, to their membership and or to their students and faculty and or uh, have actually helped us by providing some funds for the speaker series that we started a year ago uh, around the federal budget. We are about, believe it or not, we're about to move into the budget discussions for 2019. They start in February with the president's release of his budget, and then we have discussions uh, that the House or the Democrats and Republicans and potentially others will develop. Last year, we began that series with a talk by MSU Professor of Economics Charlie Ballard. Uh, we also brought in Professor Emeritus of Economics from U of M, Tom Weisskopf, later in the semester to talk about this. And, uh, but back to our co sponsors uh, James Madison College, the Residential College on Arts and Humanities. International Studies and Programs, the Julian Samora Institute, the Greater Lansing United Nations Association, the League of Women Voters Lansing Chapter, the FCNL Lansing Advocacy Team, the Edgewood United Church Justice and Peace Task Force, the ACL, ACLU of Lansing, the MSU Peace and Justice Studies Program, and the Meta Peace Team. Uh, so you can see that there, uh, at least intellectually, are a lot of people that believe this is an important issue besides just me standing up here. We are, we are very uh, committed to this issue as we have been uh, since we began in the late 1960s. Uh, I wasn't there in the 1960s, but others whose shoulders I am standing on uh, did begin to pull together the emphasis on peace and uh, discussions of anti-militarism uh, during the Vietnam conflict and have persisted uh, almost 50 years uh, raising that issue and being one of the only voices in this community consistently challenging our necessities of going to war and preparing for war. Now it's time to introduce Bill Hartung, who I've had the pleasure of reading for a number of years, but uh, finally meeting in person and uh, just getting a little tip of the iceberg of the information that he has accumulated through his long history of involvement and following the issues of militarism uh, and corporate responsibility. His work actually began, uh, as I learned today, uh, from looking at corporate responsibility uh, and, uh, and, and also working on the issues around that in uh, South Africa, the apartheid in South Africa. So he's got a long history of, of things here. He is the, uh, currently the director of the Arms and Security Project at the Center for International Policy. Uh, he has also served as a senior research fellow at the New American Foundation's strategy program and as former director of the Arms Trade Resource Center at the World Policy Institute. He actually has a lot more, but I won't go into that so much. He's authored a number of books, um, including And Weapons for All in 1995, uh, How Much Are You Making on the War, Daddy? A Quick and Dirty Guide to War Profiteering in the Bush Administration in 2003, Profits of War, Lockheed Martin and the Making of the Military Industrial Complex, uh, published in 2010, and with Miriam Pemberton, Lessons from Iraq, Avoiding the Next War. Uh, he also earlier, uh, talking about his long path to his knowledge that he's accumulated, he, he authored something for the Council on Economic Priorities called Economic Consequences of a Nuclear Freeze. Do you remember that idea of a nuclear freeze? Somehow it's fallen off the table. But Bill can talk about all of those things. Uh, so he'll talk for 30 to 40 minutes, and then we're going to open it up for Q&A. Uh, I should note that... Uh, uh, Petra Daher or Petra Daher Productions is taping this show, so we do hope to be able to uh, put it up on the web uh, for the greater world to see and to learn and to concentrate on this issue. So without any further ado, please welcome Bill Hartman. Thank you. 
recovering from the fact that Terry said I've been doing this for 40 years. <laughs> I think it's section 39. Uh, but I'm going to earn it this next year, that's for sure. Um, so, uh, as the title indicates, I'm going to talk about Eisenhower's warning and the way the arms lobby is distorting our current budget priorities. Uh, and to do that, I want to say a few things about the Eisenhower speech. Uh, I was uh, six years old when he gave it, and I wasn't really paying attention. But um, I've since watched it, read it, and so forth. Um, and I think it was interesting that he chose his farewell address to focus on this subject matter, the industrial complex, a term that he and his speechwriters coined. And the reason he did it was, uh, here he was, he's commander in chief, He's the general that helped us win World War II. He's a conservative Republican. And yet, the arms industry in league with the uniform military were saying he, essentially were saying he was soft on defense. He wasn't spending it. In particular, they wanted a new bomb, which he didn't think was necessary. Uh, and he managed to sort of hold that off until the end of his term. Uh, but he was very annoyed by things like uh, generals in the Air Force testifying to Congress that we needed this thing when the commander in chief said we didn't. Or uh, military companies advertising uh, these things in the newspapers and specialty publications about the need for this bomber, uh, using our tax dollars to do it. Um, and he was sort of blindsided, uh, actually from conservative Democrats who accused him of letting the Soviet Union develop a huge lead in uh, ballistic missiles, the missile gap. And uh, after John F. Kennedy was elected, after this had been a huge uh, issue in the 1960 campaign, it emerged that, in fact, uh, the Soviet Union had a handful of ballistic missiles, and we were moving well towards 1,000. So yes, there was a gap, but it was in completely the opposite direction. Um, so when he gave his speech, you know, part of it was about money. You know, basically, the military-industrial complex is raiding our budget. They're have unwarranted influence over how we use our resources. But he went much deeper than that. He talked about it as a threat to democracy. Uh, he said the impact was even in some ways spiritual, that it was warping our culture. Um, and the one thing that he did say, which is still very relevant, is that the only way to deal with this was an alert and knowledgeable citizenry pushing back. And I think we need that more than ever in the era of uh, fake news. So. Uh, so that was Eisenhower's speech, and I think, you know, were he still around, he'd be amazed to know that we're spending about twice as much adjusted for inflation as we spent during his last year in office. Uh, and then you have corporations like Lockheed Martin, which get 30 to 40 billion dollars a year in government money, uh, as large as the operating budget of the U.S. State Department, uh, larger than the combined budgets of about 22 states. Uh, it's this huge industrial behemoth of a size that he never could have imagined. Um, so the Eisenhower problem is with us. Um, and now we're in budget season, which is going to be endless this year, it seems. And we don't know the final number for the budget for this year, but it's going to come in somewhere, perhaps as high as $700 billion for the Pentagon regular budget, for the war budget, and for nuclear warheads produced at the Department of Energy. Um, and that's one of the highest levels since World War II. Um, and according to uh, Washington pundits of the sort that I don't listen to, um, this is the down payment. That in fact, the really big increase is going to be in the budget for 2019 that is introduced uh, in February. So um, to give some perspective, uh, that number is about as large as the next 12 countries in the world spend combined. <coughs> most of them U.S. allies. Uh, it's more than three times what China spends. It's about nine times what Russia spends. In fact, Trump's proposed increase uh, at the beginning of the year, $54 billion, was equal to the individual entire military budgets of allies like Germany, Japan, the U.K., and France. So the kind of money that we sort of throw around in Washington, not we, but the uh, representatives in Washington throw around uh, would be unheard of in almost any other country in the world to throw that much money at, at the military or their defense departments. Um, and the result of this internally is that the Pentagon 
is more than half of our discretionary budget. Now, the discretionary budget is everything but things like Medicare and Social Security that are written into law and, and require uh, changes in law to uh, change what we spend. <coughs> Whereas the discretionary budget, they just vote it up or down every year. So it's things like environmental protection and job training, education, uh, serious, you know, some aspects of health care, administering justice, almost everything you think of the government that's doing is in that discretionary budget, other than Medicare and Social Security, a handful of other things. Uh, so the Pentagon's already getting more than half of that, and it, it's, the, it's a piece of the pie that's growing. It's kind of devouring the rest of the budget. Um, and this coming year is going to be particularly challenging because, as you know, uh, we had this huge tax cut bill, which means the government's going to have less revenue to play with. And some in Congress want to go after now uh, Medicare and Social Security, the other entitlement programs, while the Pentagon budget continues to grow. So this is very similar to the Ronald Reagan formula. It's kind of like Reaganomics on steroids. You know, Reagan came in, he said, you know, we're going to increase the military, we're going to cut taxes, and we're going to trim domestic spending, and we're going to have a huge <coughs> surge of growth. Um, now, in the case of Reagan, he actually uh, had to backtrack. Um, deficits were uh, running large by the standards of the day. He actually came back and instituted several tax increases to reduce the deficit. Uh, at the end of his term, after much pressure from the peace movement, not only did he reduce Pentagon spending, but he reduced nuclear weapons. Uh, and this was the guy who, when he came in, you know, joked around and before his weekly radio interview about how the bombing would start in five minutes. Uh, he had officials who said things like, if we had enough shovels, we could survive a nuclear war. Um, and of course, he described the Soviet Union as the evil empire. Uh, but by the end of his term, as a result of things like the nuclear peace deal, <clears throat> um, he, he made statements like, you know, a nuclear war can never be won and must never be fought. Uh, he came this close at Reykjavik to a deal to eliminate nuclear weapons altogether until sort of hawks in his administration kind of took them in the woodshed and sort of straightened them out from their point of view. Uh, but even so, <coughs> nuclear weapons were reduced. Many nuclear weapons were taken out of Europe. Somebody who came into office as somebody we were afraid was going to launch a nuclear war uh, became, at least by his own admission, a nuclear weapons abolitionist. So we've been in difficult times like this before, and we've been able to turn it around. Now, of course, uh, we have a different kind of person in Washington now, who like, you know, might make Ronald Reagan look like a Nobel laureate. But uh, nonetheless, I think you know, the, the fight is there for us to have, and I think we can win it. Um, so I, I think the whole problem with the current approach is it's based on a false sense of what makes us safe. You know, spending more on nuclear weapons. We're fighting seven wars currently all over the world which are the ones that were inherited from President Obama, not even the ones that Trump made himself start. Um, and the notion is that that's, that's what our security is about, you know, piling up more weapons than other people. But as Eisenhower pointed out, if you want to have a healthy society, people have to be educated, they have to be able to make a living, they have to be healthy, and that's sort of the core of your defense. And then weaponry is just one hopefully small part of the equation. And of course, our foreign policy becomes so militarized now that uh, particularly in the more hawkish denizens of Washington, uh, all they think about is weaponry and troops as the foundations of our security. So there's a very narrow and, to my sense, misguided view of what makes us safe that is driving part of this spending, along with the fear that people have, which is legitimate in many ways. You know, fear of North Korea, fear of terrorism. Uh, but the question is, are any of these things the Pentagon's doing making us safer from any of those threats and challenges? Um, so I want to talk briefly about the, the cost of these wars. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, the United States has <coughs> troops, is bombing, is, has a significant role in seven con significant conflicts right now. Iraq, Syria, Libya, Somalia, Yemen, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. Could be drone strikes, could be bombing, could be special forces. Uh, and then, 
there's other sort of short-term missions, training and, and, and so forth. Our special forces last year visited 149 countries for some sort of interaction with the local militaries, uh, which is pushing about three quarters of the countries on Earth. Uh, we also arm and train about 100 countries. And so essentially our foreign policy and the face of our foreign policy is troops and weapons to most of the world. Uh, and of course, as you know, President Trump wants to scale back the State Department. He's, they're not appointing ambassadors. In Africa, for example, uh, last time we checked, there were five ambassadors confirmed for the 54 nations of Africa. We have no ambassador in Korea in the middle of this huge crisis. And there's no indication that they're in any rush to do that. They seem to want to just let the <clears throat> State Department fall apart just by lack of use. Um, so we've got that huge militarization and military presence. And then, of course, these wars have human costs. By, by a conservative estimate, about 300,000 civilians have died in the post-911 wars. Um, and that continues. Uh, probably the most um, heart-rending current conflict is the war in Yemen, where thousands of people have been killed with US supplied aircraft and bombs, where there's a blockade that's driven the country to the brink of famine, where there's a cholera outbreak ca caused by the destruction of basic civilian sanitary facilities uh, that could reach a million people shortly. Um, and all of that is done by a, a coalition led by Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, heavily armed by the United States. The United States is refueling the Saudi planes that are used to carry out the bombing raids. Um, many of the, much of the equipment used to impose the blockade is also from the US and its Western allies. Uh, and a lot of us have been working to cut off that US arms supplies uh, and with help from some members of Congress who've taken the lead on this. Um, so you've got that sort of you know, bleeding sore and, and, and I think stain on the conscience of the world that we can't stop that conflict. Um, there's been reports recently that the Trump administration in these war zones that it inherited has dramatically stepped up the numbers of bombs, they've uh, reduced the rules of engagement to be less careful about whether they hit civilians, and civilian dress, uh, deaths have actually tripled in the first year of the Trump administration from what they were in the last year of the Obama administration. And a lot of this doesn't get a lot of attention because, you know, everybody has to get worked up about Trump's tweet of the day. Um, and rightly so. Uh, but I think we have to also watch what he's doing and not just what he's you know, saying with 140 or 280 characters. Um, so all these wars cost immense amounts of money. Uh, there's a project at Brown University called the Cost of War Project, which looked at you know, the budgetary costs of the wars, the economic impact of putting all this money into warfare, and possibly most importantly, the cost of taking care of our veterans. Uh, many of the veterans of these wars, of course, will be taken care of for life, as they should be, with taxpayer money. And we've had hundreds of thousands of people come back from Iraq and Afghanistan with post-traumatic stress, syn uh, stress syndrome, um, traumatic brain injuries, not to mention uh, losing limbs and, and even more severe injuries. And so all of that is going to cost money for, for many of these young vets for 30, 40, 50 years of their lifetimes. So if you put all that together, it comes out to about $5.6 trillion, uh, which, uh, you know, one way of looking at it is uh, if you took a stack of dollar bills uh, and you had a trillion of them, you could reach the moon, basically make a bridge to the moon. And then we could start towards Mars and who knows where else. Um, another way of thinking about it is uh, this whole budget deficit argument that's been made since 2011 was about uh, cutting $2 trillion in spending uh, over 10 years. So here's close to $6 trillion. So that deficit concern could have been put aside, and there still would have been trillion dollars, uh, many trillions of dollars to invest in our society, um, which even Donald Trump pointed out. Uh, you know, I, it's sort of like the case of um, even the stop clock is right twice a day, but he was correct in saying that, of course, he's not doing anything about it. Um, so the biggest beneficiaries of all this are the arms corporations. A lot of times when you have debates in Washington and anybody has the temerity to say, well, let's 
reduce the Pentagon budget. <coughs> the argument is, well, we can't undercut the troops. You know, it's all about the troops. Uh, but in fact, close to half of the Pentagon budget goes to corporations, like Lockheed Martin and General Dynamics and Raytheon, north of Grumman and Boeing. In fact, those five alone get about $100 billion a year of our tax money. Uh, and all the contractors combined get three to four hundred billion. So 40 to 50 percent of that huge Pentagon budget goes right back out the door uh, to corporations. And, you know, it would be one thing if uh, they were using this money to effectively defend us and promote peace in the world. But uh, quite to the contrary, if you look at waste alone, just that element of the problem, um, the Pentagon has this thing called the Defense Business Board, which is supposed to give them tips on how to, you know, be more efficient, uh, which is a thankless task, needless to say. But uh, they did a report that indicated that just excess bureaucratic overhead was costing the Pentagon $25 billion a year. Um, and this is at a time when they say, oh, you know, we don't have enough money to keep the planes flying, we don't train our pilots long enough. And some of the programs that they're, you know, claiming are star for funds cost a, you know, a tiny, tiny fraction of this $25 billion a year in weight. So you know, if they wanted to fund those programs, they could. But they're using the troops and this idea that our military is crumbling as a way to pitch for more money. And this was very clear when they, when they got this report from their own advisory <coughs> board. Uh, they tried to bury it. Because they didn't want to go up to Congress and say, oh, we need an extra $100 billion this year, but by the way, we're wasting all this money on bureaucratic overhead. They didn't think it was a good funding pitch. So they buried that report. Um, then you look at things like how many contractors uh, they employ. And there's something like 600,000 private contractors employed by the Pentagon. So some of them, you know, they maintain weapon systems, they build weapons. Some of them write intelligence briefs that go to the president. Uh, some of them do important things like, you know, council veterans and so forth. But a lot of this could be done and is being done at the same time by government employees uh, for less money. So my colleagues at the Project and Government Oversight, which is a, a government accountability group based in DC, uh, estimated that if you just cut you know, about 100,000 of those, 600,000, you'd still have half a million contractors. You could save another $20 billion a year. So between the $25 billion in waste and the $20 billion in excess contractors, there's huge amounts of money just sloshing around at the Pentagon, even before you get to the question of how much we're spending on the wars. Um, and then you've got things like the new combat aircraft, the F-35, which is basically the most expensive weapons program ever undertaken by the Pentagon. And as one analyst pointed out, it may never be ready for combat, which for the peace movement, maybe that's a good thing. But nonetheless, it's supposed to be a combat weapon, and yet it doesn't for example, uh, it can't communicate with troops on the ground. It spends more time in maintenance than it does flying. Um, it's the um, pilot, rather than using visual sight lines, has this big electronic helmet that's supposed to give them all the information they need to make decisions about whether to bomb or shoot down a plane or any number of other things. Uh, that costs $400,000 per helmet, and that's not worth it. So, uh, this program is just chugging along, and even the Pentagon's own testing office said, you know, this thing doesn't work yet. You really shouldn't be building them in these numbers. And their answer is just push the money out the door. And in fact, some of the ones they've built already, they've had to go back and fix them. Just a year or two after they've come off the production line, they're already doing these retrofits. And the companies that build the shoddy weapons in the first place also get the contracts to fix them. So it's great work if you can get it. Um, and then, you know, probably the the worst and most dangerous thing of all is the Pentagon's plan to build a whole new generation of nuclear armed uh, submarines and bombers and land-based missiles uh, and new nuclear warheads at a cost of $1.7 trillion over 30 years. And this was a Pentagon plan before Trump came into office. Trump is adding his own unique stamp. So he's got a new nuclear policy review that's been leaked and is going to be more formally uh, introduced that would do things like build more usable nuclear weapons. And the twisted logic of nuclear strategy, the idea is, well, 
you know, the other side's got to be afraid that you're going to attack them, or they will attack you. You have to deter them. You have to scare them into staying away, not attacking. And so, the nuclear theorists have come up with this idea that, well, you know, the current weapons are too powerful. They're not going to believe it that we would ever use them. So let's build smaller, you know, less powerful nuclear weapons. Many of which are still much larger than the ones that destroyed hundreds of thousands of people in Hiroshima, but small by today's standards. And of course. Why on earth would you want to make it easier to use nuclear weapons, whether or not Donald Trump was the one making the decision? Uh, but that's part of the Trump uh, policy reform. Um, so then the, the question is, you know, what's driving all of this? You know, there's the kind of the misguided strategy. Um, there's the perpetual fighting of these wars. But there's also, of course, the military-industrial complex that Eisenhower warned us about. And the arms lobby is very effective. Actually, its, it's only business plan is to lobby Congress and the president to get more of our tax money. And they're very good at it. And one of the things they do is to promote the jobs generated by Pentagon spending. And you can be pretty sure once they trot out the jobs argument, it's because they don't have any other good arguments. Uh, probably the system doesn't work. Probably it doesn't serve a real need. But you know, push comes to shove. If you build something like the F-35, and you have subcontractors in dozens of states, and you exaggerate the number of jobs it creates, uh, a lot of members of Congress are going to think twice before voting against it, uh, because they don't want to vote against jobs in their district, understandably. And if you multiply that many times over, how they build the nuclear submarines, how they build the bombers, how they build the ships, pretty soon most members have some concern about if they go after the Pentagon budget, the industry and others are going to come back at them and say, you don't care about the people in your district. Um, so that pork barrel politics is a huge weapon, uh, lobbying weapon in the hands of the arms industry. But then they do the traditional things. You know, they hire lobbyists. Um, in any given year, the, the arms industry has somewhere between 700 and 1,000 <coughs> lobbyists, which is, you know, in some years, almost two for every member of Congress. Um, they spend you know, tens of millions of dollars on campaign contributions. And most of it is to members of key committees that make the decisions about what to spend, armed services and defense appropriations uh, primarily. Um, and then you've got the, the uh, phenomenon of the revolving door, which is where people go from government into industry and lobby their old colleagues on behalf of the industry. So, uh, you know, somebody will go, for example, there was a woman named Darlene Druyan who was in the Pentagon, one of the chief procurement officers. And before she left office, she held sort of a bidding war about which contractor would pay her the most. And Boeing won the bidding war. Not only did they offer her huge sums, but they also employed some of her relatives. Um, and unlike other cases where this, I mean, this kind of thing happens all the time. Um, John McCain got particularly exercised about this, and he subpoenaed a bunch of emails. And they sort of had a smoking gun about how she was literally cutting Boeing slack on all his defense contracts because she knew she was going to cash in with a big job with them when she got out. And so she did uh, nine months in prison, as did another Boeing executive. Um, but the same kind of thing happens. They're just quieter about it. They don't send as many emails. Um, and just in terms of the sort of the sheer kind of proportions, uh, a report at the Boston Globe a couple of years ago tracked what happens to admirals and generals when they leave the service. And of the 39 he tracked over a number of year period, 34 of them went to work on the boards of defense contractors, as lobbyists for defense contractors, or set up their own defense consulting firms. So, the ones that were the exceptions were the ones who went and did something else. But most of them went straight into industry. And it spins the other way as well. You have people come from industry and make policy in government, often in ways that help their former employers. And this is particularly true under Trump. You've got uh, James Mattis, Secretary of Defense, was on the board of General Dynamics, one of the top five defense contractors. In fact, the top three or four positions at the Pentagon are filled by former executives of General Dynamics, Lockheed Martin, Raytheon. Um, John Kelly, the White House Chief of Staff, uh, 
worked for several major defense contractors. Um, and, you know, the, there's a guy named Lee Fang who writes for The Intercept, who early on did a, a sort of an assessment. And there were already, you know, early in Trump's term, about two dozen former defense industry people making policy in government about how much their former employers should get of our tax money. So you've got that huge conflict of interest, which is a huge benefit to the industry when it comes to Washington to lobby for what it wants. Um, and then there's all kinds of peculiar ways that they'll lobby. So for example, I call these things party favors. Uh, you know, uh, the late Jack Murtha, who was a legendary practitioner of pork barrel politics from Pennsylvania, um, used to literally have contractors you know, put a factory in his district in exchange for him getting them more contracts. Um, his wife's favorite charity was the Johnstown, Pennsylvania Symphony Orchestra, which became one of the finest symphony orchestras in America uh, because its main donors were Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, <coughs> Boeing, and all these contractors wanted to curry favor with Jack Murtha. Um, Trent Bott, uh, the former Appropriations Committee Chair in the Senate from Mississippi, uh, in his honor, the University of Mississippi set up the Trent Lott Leadership Institute. And Lockheed Martin immediately wrote a check for a million dollars to support that. Um, there's a guy named Buck McKeon who used to run House Armed Services. His wife ran for the California State Legislature on a platform of you shouldn't have to pay for plastic bags. And um, interestingly enough, this became an urgent issue for Lockheed Martin and Boeing and Northrop Grumman who funded her campaign for the state legislature and claimed it had nothing to do with trying to make Buck McKee unhappy with them. Um, so there's, there's all these kind of indirect ways that they also try to exert influence. Um, so anyway, so that's the good news. Uh, <laughs> or, or the depressing news, depending on your cast of mind. Uh, but I, I do think we have some leverage uh, to deal with this now. Um, for one thing, there's been this huge surge of resistance to the various policies emanating from Washington, be it on immigration or racial justice or health care, tax policy. And, you know, we've taken some hits, especially recently, but that movement's growing, as we saw in the Women's March as recently. And um, I think, you know, one thing that's been missing in, in the discussion is the amount of money we're throwing at the Pentagon. You don't see a lot of signs about it. It's not integrated into the uh, you know, platforms of the various groups that have sprung up. But I think that can change for a few reasons. First of all, um, Reverend William Barber, who ran the Moral Mondays movement in North Carolina, which had quite a lot of success pushing back some of the more regressive policies there, is going to launch kind of a new version of the Poor People's Campaign that Martin Luther King was starting at the end of his life. So it will deal with racial justice, it will deal with inequality, it will deal with the war economy, and it will deal with restoring the environment. And a number of groups have signed on so far, and he's going around the country speaking about this issue, and they're gonna do a big launch of the full campaign uh, around Mother's Day of this year. So, uh, you know, if, if that gets traction, then the issue of Pentagon spending will be integrated into a much larger movement. Um, and then, in addition, there is still some pressure from the right uh, about this. Uh, mostly the most conservative Republicans who still are concerned about the deficit, although I believe they did vote for this tax cut, so it's selective concern. Um, but nonetheless, a lot of them would like to keep the Pentagon budget capped. They believe the Pentagon should finally be able to pass an audit which it has never done in its history. Um, and they're putting pressure on that front. So I, I don't think that's going to be the primary sort of um, pressure that we need, but it, it'll be another factor uh, in the mix. And then I think people will, uh, of necessity, have to start paying attention to this because uh, now that we've had the tax cut, now that they're going after some of the most popular programs in the history of the country, like Medicare and Social Security, and yet trying to increase the Pentagon budget. I think the trade-offs will be more stark, and I think people will be more open to speaking out against increases in Pentagon spending. Um, 
So I have no idea how long that was, but that's my initial statement of the case. And uh, so we should have some conversation. Thank you.